inferential statistic. And the confidence interval is the first part of inferential statistic, which we call the interval estimation. There is an interval estimation versus point estimation. Point estimation is hypothesis testing, right? which will be chapter 9 and 10. Okay? All right, chapter 8, confidence interval estimation. And uh, this slide is actually from chapter 7. We've uh, done this in chapter 7. We found out, I mean, the, 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 the setup of this problem was uh, you know, cereal box questions, box filling, right? And the machine fills the cereal into boxes, and uh, somehow we know the population mean is 368, and standard deviation was 15. So the question was, if we selected 25 boxes into our sample repeatedly, right? Then what could be the, uh, the, the interval, right? interval of sample means that would contain 95% of the sample means. Okay? All right, so based on that, we, uh, what we did was we uh, first located the z-score, which had 5% outside the interval. So this uh, shaded, uh, orange shaded area is 95%, and uh, outside would be 5%, which means uh, on each side of the tails, we have two and a half percent area, okay? So from now on, I'm going to use a little bit uh, new uh, expression. As you see here, it's a Z alpha divided by two. And what that means is this is a Z score, which has alpha divided by two area on its outside, okay? So here's one Z alpha divided by two, and this is actually a it should be should have been negative z alpha divided by two. Okay, so from the z score, we we can I mean z table, we can find the z score which has 0 0.025 area on its outside. You know how to do that, right? So what is alpha here? Huh? Alpha. The uh, formal name of alpha is the level of significance. Level of significance. What does that mean? And uh, you know, how is it used? You have to wait until chapter 9. Okay? I'll t tell you exactly what uh, alpha means. It has to do with uh, type 1. Uh, we have to talk about type 1 and type 2 error in hypothesis testing. And at that time, you will understand it exactly, right, perfectly. Right? But right now, alpha is level of significance. 1 minus alpha is called the level of confidence. Okay? So, or sometimes we just call it confidence level. Okay? So if alpha was uh, 0.05, that confidence level is 0.95. Okay. And we're looking for 95% confidence interval. Okay. So many times I write it as 1 minus alpha, 100 times 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval. For mu. Okay. That's the typical question we, we deal with in, uh, in the confidence interval question situation. Okay. So if you're looking for 95% confidence interval, that means the alpha level is 0.05. Okay? 0.1 minus 0.05 times 100, that's 95. Right? All right. So that's what we did uh, in the last class. Yeah? We first located the z-score, which uh, has 0.025 on its outside. Okay? And we found out that that's 1.96, right? So using the formula, z-score formula, you know, z-score is x bar minus mu over sigma over square root of n, right? From this, since we know mu, which in this question that's 368, right? We re rearrange this equation and found out x bar was the mu plus minus z uh, times sigma over square root of n, right? 
that's what we did, right? We found out the lower limit and upper limit. Okay? So that's nothing new. Okay. So in this question, uh, okay, here we go. So we actually found out the lower limit was 362.12. Upper limit was 373.88, and it says uh, it contains 95% of the sample mean. Right? All right. So if you don't know, if you didn't know the population mean, then you will use sample mean, which is the, you know the closest concept to the population mean, to estimate the population mean, right? So if you use the x bar, which is a sample mean of 362.3, uh, then the, our interval would have been 356.42, 368.18, right? So this is a little bit uh, confusing because uh, we're trying to reverse the situation. I mean, the first of, in, in, the, in the previous chapter, we knew the population mean, and we found out the confidence mean of our whole sample, right? But now we're getting into a situation where we don't know the population mean, right? So what the chapter is doing at this situation, at this stage, is, well, we had this, um, uh, confidence interval mu plus uh, 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 minus z sigma over square root of n and uh, mu plus z prime square root uh, standard error. Okay. The question is, what if we didn't know the population mean? What could we have done? Okay. Then, uh, what if we used x bar? You know, we took a sample, and sample mean came out to be 362.3, right? So we could have substitute, substituted 362.3, right? And then actually calculated the confidence interval for unknown population mean, right? And then we found out that when we did that, the, we found out that uh, the confidence interval was between 356.42 and 368.18, which actually contains 368, right? Remember, in this particular problem, we know 368 was the actual population mean. Okay? So, bear with me at this part. I, I know it's a little bit confusing. Why do we do this, you know? front and back and reverse and uh, you know if you know 368 is the actual population mean why are we trying to find the confidence interval which contains actual population mean okay? but uh, it will get clear pretty soon okay? so here's the question but what about the intervals from other possible samples of size 25 right well the question is, uh, we took one sample of 25 boxes and x bar came out to be here, right? And this time, when we substituted for that, right, uh, we, and calculated the uh, confidence interval for unknown parameter, uh, it comes out right, because this, whatever the number came out here, contained 368, right? So this confidence interval was valid, okay? But that's not, that may not be always the case, depending on the size of the sample mean, right? If you took another sample, right? And suppose the uh, sample mean came out to be 370. Will that still give the, these two numbers that will contain actual population mean? No? That's the question, right? So here, uh, we did uh, some e experiments. Right? So we took five different samples. The first sample was the, the one we already talked about. Right? First time we took a sample of 25 boxes, sample mean was 362.3. Right? 
And based on that, when we calculated the confidence interval, right, it included 368, which is the known population mean. So it says yes. Second time, you took another 25 boxes and measured the sample mean, right? And based on that, you calculated the confidence interval, and it also contained 368, right? But the third time, the sample mean came out to be 360, and based on that, when you calculated the confidence interval, this range did not include 360. I'm yeah, um, um, 368, right? Remember, we know that actual population mean was 368, right? So it says no, right? So the point here is uh, depending on how you select a sample and what value you get as a sample mean, your confidence interval sometimes will include the actual population mean, sometimes it will not, right? More exactly, I think I gave you, I, I drew uh, this graph, similar graph last class. Yeah? So here we have first sample mean, second sample mean, third sample mean, and so on, right? And uh, most of the times, sample mean will be pretty close to actual population mean, right? And if you calculate the 95% confidence interval, uh, based on the sample mean using this formula, okay, then that uh, uh, interval will contain actual population mean. Right? But sometimes it is possible that you can get very extreme sample mean somehow because you are selecting a random sample. Right? So it is possible that somehow you selected the sa uh, boxes that contain very little content the amount of content, right? So in once in a while, right, you can get something like this, this sample mean, right, that is uh, outside this range, okay? And if you use this number to calculate uh, the population mean, uh, uh, the, the confidence interval about the population mean, then that interval will not include, right? These this, uh, lines here, show the upper limit and lower limit, upper limit and lower limit. So the length of this bar is the z times s sigma over square root of n, right? Remember, the formula is uh, plus minus z times the square root uh, sigma over square root of n, right? So, since you are adding the same distance and subtracting the same distance, right? If the sample mean happens to be outside this critical value, then this bar here, this uh, length of the red bar, will not reach actual population mean, right? It's going to be too short, right? So this range will not include actual population mean. You have to get this kind of intuitive understanding. Okay, so more exactly, all right. we have the, uh, the formula, actual formula for confidence interval for population mean, right? 100 times 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval estimate for the unknown population mean. That's going to be your sample mean plus minus z alpha divided by 2 times sigma over square root of n, right? And you can use 90%, 95%, 99%, or these days you have computer. So, I mean, in the old days, you had to use the table, right? So in, in, in order to use the z-score, you typically we resorted 90%, 95%, 99%. But these days, you can use any number. Uh, if you want 88.75% confidence interval, you can do that too, right? Okay. All right. Uh, so here, let's do a very quick uh, example. Uh, suppose we have sample of 11 circuits from a large normal population, and uh, we know the 
mean resistance of 22.2 ohms out of those 11 samples. Okay, so 2.2 is the sample mean. Okay? And from the past, ex past experience, we know the standard deviation is 0.35 ohms. Okay? You may not be uh, familiar with this electronic uh, terms, okay? but uh, well, uh, so confidence interval using the formula, we found that the actual population mean can be between 1.9932 and 2.4068. But the calculation is simple, you use the formula. What's the interpretation? Interpretation is we are 95% confident that the true mean resistance of the population right, is between 1.9932 and 2.4068. Right? Or another way to interpret that is 95% of the intervals formed in this manner. In other words, if you use this formula and calculate the interval like this, right? If you do that 100 times, right? Then 95 times this interval will include the actual population mean. Make sure you understand that clearly here. You can under, understand it in two different ways. The first way is you are 95% confident that actual population mean exists between these two numbers. Right? Or another way to understand it is if you calculate the, uh, the confidence interval 100 times using the uh, formula, then 95% of the times, uh, or 95 times, that interval will include the actual population mean. Okay. All right, I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, please read the chapter 8 very thoroughly, carefully. We'll try to finish the chapter next class. Okay. Well, or <coughs> interval estimation, which is a part of inferential statistics. Okay. And uh, we're talking about this... Uh, well, I think I told you there are two different types of uh, statistical inference. One is point estimation, the other is the interval estimation, and this is the interval estimation. Okay? And uh, last class we learned the formula. Okay. I guess white chokes are all gone. For the uh, what is it? What we call hundred times one minus alpha percent confidence interval for the population mu, population mean mu. Okay, and you use sample mean x plus minus z alpha divided by two sigma over square root of n. Okay, that's the formula. Okay, so calculation is pretty simple. You know how to use the formula. Okay. And you should be able to interpret <coughs> your uh, result. Okay? So here are two uh, possible interpretation. We are, you know, 95%, which means alpha is 0 0.05. If alpha, I think I told you the the name of alpha. Alpha is level of significance. Okay, and one one minus alpha is a, a confidence level or level of confidence. Okay. So if you use alpha of 0 0.05, then you're calculating 95% confident, okay? confidence interval. So once you find uh, a range for uh, unknown population mean, then interpretation is you are that percent confident that actual population mean exists between these two numbers. Okay? Another possible interpretation or use of this result is that if you calculate the confidence interval using this formula 100 times, okay, then you will be correct that uh, uh, you will be correct 95 times out of 100 times. Okay? In other words, you will be correct 95% of the times, okay, saying that actual population mean exists between these two numbers. Okay?
All right, so if you understand that, that is good. So here we are getting into a, a slightly different uh, topic today. And uh, here the topic is, what if the sigma population standard deviation was unknown, right? Then what can we do, okay? And if you think about it, this is a very good question, okay? And very important question, because uh, you remember this formula for sigma? Which is square root of xi of, yeah, xi minus mu square uh, 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 n, okay? So from each observation, you have to subtract the population mean, right? And then you can calculate population standard deviation, right? But the trouble is, population mean is usually unknown. And that's why exactly we are doing this, because mu is unknown. We are trying to find the confidence interval, right? Which can contain actual population mean, right? So if we don't know the population mean, then there's no way we can calculate population standard deviation, right? So using this formula is probably impossible, right? And that's the case in most of the cases, in most of times, in real life. So if you look at actual researches, right? Almost all the time, I, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time, uh, you will not see using the actual research using sigma, okay? And what that means is we cannot use standard error in this form, right? And that means uh, we cannot use z-score, right? Because uh, uh, using z-score means this, the, we're using standard error uh, of standard error, right? Which follows normal distribution, okay? When the certain conditions are met, okay? So, what we can do? Well, we can substitute the S, or sample standard deviation, for sigma, in case sigma is unknown, okay? And uh, then we have to change something, because uh, we're, instead of population standard deviation, we are using S, S over square root of N, okay? But S is a sample standard deviation, right? So from a population, right? There is population mean, population standard deviation, but here we are talking about selecting samples, okay? But every time you select a sample, you will you probably get different standard deviation, depending on which sample you use, right? You may get even slightly different numbers, right? So we are ha having an issue here because instead of using population standard, standard deviation, which is just one value, you know, you used to use just one known value of standard deviation, right? But now we are talking about variable sample standard deviation, okay? So this introduces extra variability or uncertainty, right, in our analysis, okay? So instead of Z distribution, in that case, we will use T distribution, okay? And uh, t it is very important for you to understand the T distribution really well, okay? Because as I said, in reality, almost all the cases, uh, all the statistical testing are based on T distribution is instead of Z distribution or t-test instead of z-test, okay? All right, so the using the formula is pretty simple because if you look at this formula, it's exactly the same as uh, the, the confidence interval formula as before. We use a sample mean plus minus, instead of z alpha divided by two, we use t alpha divided by two. I think I, just in case you were not here yesterday or last class, okay? Z alpha divided by two means that the Z score which has alpha divided by two area on its outside, okay? So we are talking about the same thing. Instead of Z distribution, 
we have t distribution. Okay. We're talking about t score, which has alpha divided by two on its outside. Okay. There's nothing different. Okay. And then uh, instead of sigma divided by square root of n, we use s over square root of n. So it is uh, instead of population standard error, this is sample standard error. Okay. So using the formula is exactly the same. Calculation is simple. We just have to keep in mind a couple of things. Okay. The, uh, the assumptions are uh, population standard deviation is unknown, of course, right? If population standard deviation is known, think about it. If sigma is known, that means we already know the population mean, right? Because without population mean, there's no way we can calculate uh, population standard deviation, which means we probably don't need any inference on, on population mean, right? So yes, uh, of course, we don't know the population standard deviation. That's why we would use this formula. Okay? But more important assumption here is population is normally distributed. Okay? Uh, in order to use uh, this formula or T distribution, or, okay, this T distribution, okay? we have to assume the population or samples are selected from population which is normally distributed. Okay? which is a big assumption, okay? And uh, there is a way we can verify that. You know, we, we, we uh, learned the normality test, right? How to do the normality test, right? So you can verify whether the population is normal or not, or population can be considered normal or not, okay? But what happens if population turns out to be non-normal? then does that mean we cannot use this formula? Not necessarily. If the population is not normal, then we can simply use sufficiently large sample. What makes it possible? Based on what we can say that? Yeah, but what, what makes us use that uh, idea? Who says it's fine if you know, as long as the sample size is greater than 30. Central limit theorem, CRT, remember, right? I told you CRT is so convenient, right? It makes our lives a lot easier. Okay? Without CRT, you know, the most of the, pop, uh, the, uh, the statistical tests would have been impossible, right? Because, uh, you know, either it is very difficult to verify the population is normally distributed, well, first of all, I mean, it is typically impossible to use entire population because population is so large, right? So that means that pr you probably wouldn't be able to even run the normality test on the population, right? So you just have to assume the population is normal, right? But how do you know whether it's a, it's a reasonable assumption, okay? Well, because we have CRT. <laughs> Central limit theorem. Central limit theorem allows us to go on assuming that the population is normal, right? As long as you have a sample size of 30 or larger, uh, or even if you have a pretty good idea that sample is, you know, relatively uh, symmetric, then you can even use a smaller sample size, okay? So it's a very convenient uh, theorem, okay? Okay. So here's a little bit of T distribution. T distribution looks just like normal distribution. Okay? It's symmetric, it's mound shape, it's bell shape. Okay? But one very important characteristic of T distribution is its shape, the exact shape, depends on degrees of freedom. And degrees of freedom for T distribution is n minus 1 sample size minus one, okay? Uh, if the sample size is pretty small, something like this, if you have degrees of freedom of five, right? Which means sample size is, if degrees of freedom was five, what's the sample size? Six, okay? So if you had only six observations in your sample, right? 
then the T distribution happens to be really wide, wide and flat like this, okay? which means there's a lot of variability. Yeah, we're talking about uh, distribution of standard error of estimate using sample, right? So what we are saying is this standard error of estimate of, of sample, right, distribution or samples, um, well, this standard error, right, based on sample standard deviation, right, follows T distribution, right? But if the sample size is pretty similar, think about it. If you have, say, 1,000 observations in your population, right, and every time you select a sample, very, very small sample, only six observations in your sample, right? So every time you select the sample, sample mean and sample standard deviation can be quite different, as opposed to 600, right? Suppose every time you select a sample, you select 600 out of 1,000 observations in your sample, right? Then the variability will be pretty small, right? Because you have to include almost, I mean, more than half of the entire population in your sample, right? So whether you select this part or this part or this part or this part, right? The uh, sample means and standard deviation will probably come out pretty similar, right? But if you select a very sm small sample, right, then you can be from here or here or here, right? Depending on the you know, how you select this sample, you can get pretty wide variance or wide variability, right? That's the idea, right? So if the sample size is pretty small, then the distribution can be very wide, right? You have to allow a very large or very small number for the standard error, okay? But as the sample size increases, it becomes narrower, and if the sample size is sufficiently large, well, look at this part. If the degrees of freedom happens to be infinity, right, then it becomes exactly the normal distribution. Okay? Make sure you understand that, right? So if the sample size is pretty large, then T distribution is almost identical to normal distribution. Just keep that in mind, okay? Oh, here... The name of the t-distribution is student, student's t-distribution, right? We're not talking about you guys, right? The student is a pen name of a guy named uh, uh, William Gosset. William Gosset. That's the pen name. Instead of using his real name, I mean, if you think about it, this is the guy who made the, the biggest contribution in statistics. Without t-distribution, you can't use any statistical testing right, in reality. Right? But he didn't use his real name when he published his result, I mean, the introduction of t-tables and t-distribution. <coughs> the reason was he was working for a company which any idea who, which company you work for? I think you guys are pretty familiar with this company. Right? Have you ever heard of Guinness Beer? Okay. Guinness Brewery in Ireland, right? About 100 years ago, about early 20th century, right? He was working for Guinness Brewery in uh, Ireland, okay? And apparently they used very scientific process to produce their, the best beer. Uh, has anybody tried this beer, Guinness beer? It's a dark beer, right? And pretty good, right? And I'm sure you can tr test, taste uh, right outside the Hanyang University. There's a place, I've been to a place, I forgot the name, but you can try uh, all the imported beers, right? Just to admit, you've been there, right? Right? I'm sure you've been there. <laughs> all right. Anyway, so he uh, 
was the one who introduced this, the uh, concept of T distribution and the, the T table, right, which is vital or crucial in the, 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 the area of statistics. Okay? But uh, this was uh, proprietary data. In other words, it's a private data for a company, right? So instead of using his real name, he used the pen name, student. He called himself student of statistics, right? How humble, right? So, yeah, that's the idea of this, the name, student's key distribution. Yeah? Uh, so perhaps um, this weekend, if you drink beer, maybe spend a little more money and try Guinness beer, okay? And maybe explain this to your girlfriend and she'll be impressed, right? Discuss statistics while you drink. Okay. All right, so how do you use a T-table? T-table is quite different from Z-table. You know, Z-table has Z-scores on the left and uh, the, the top row, and the probability is inside, right? But the T-table has probability here on top. This is the upper tail area, and that's the alpha or alpha divided by two, right? And on the left side, there's degrees of freedom. Again, the T distribution depends on degrees of freedom, so you have to specify which degrees of freedom, right? And then what you see inside the table here are actually T scores, like Z scores, okay? So if you're looking for, yeah, this is the, uh, the uh, alpha value happens to be 0.1 here. So alpha divided by two is 0.05, and sub sample size is three, so degrees of freedom is two. Then the T score, in other words, T value which has 0.05 on its outside is 2.92, okay? Let me show you a real T table here from your, the back of uh, your textbook. Okay. And on page 696, I think this is probably 6th uh, edition, but 7th edition may be slightly different on page number. Right. So here's a T table, critical values of T. And here you say alpha. Well, wh why doesn't it say alpha divided by 2? Uh, well, it depends on whether you're running one tail test or two tail tests. Okay? We'll talk about it in the next chapter, right? If you're running one tail test, you use entire alpha on one side. If you're running two tail tests, you use alpha divided by two on one side. Okay? Uh, when you're dealing with confidence interval, we are dealing with two ways. The uh, left side, right side, lower, lower limit, upper limit. Okay? So this is a two-tail test in a sense, okay? So when you're dealing with uh, uh, confidence interval, you, you use alpha divided by two. But doesn't matter, as long as you know what you're looking for here. So if you're looking for 0.05 on its outside, let's say sample size is 10, okay? So degrees of freedom is nine, right? And you're looking for T-score, which is 0.05 on its outside. Then from this area, you upper tail area, Okay, uh, so it's a little bit confusing this table, but uh, it, it kindly shows cumulative probability, which is one minus alpha here. Okay, so alpha is 0.05, which means one minus alpha is 0.95, right? Then, if you come down to degrees of freedom nine here, that t score would be 1.8331. Okay, so that's how you use a t table. Okay, understand how you use T table? You, so you need to know alpha, you need to know degrees of freedom. Then you can find T score. Rami, focus on the class, okay? All right, if you go down to, let me show you just one more thing here on T table. The next table, the first table shows until the degrees of, degrees of freedom of 50. The next table, the same thing, starting from degrees of freedom of 51 up to 120 and uh, infinity, and if you go to infinity, the numbers are something like 1.28, 1.65, 1.96. These numbers should be familiar to you. Any idea where you've seen these numbers, like 
1.6, should it be 9.6? Yeah, 1.645, 1.9, 1.9, 1.96, right? These are the Z scores for the 10%, 5%, something like that, right? 1% uh, area, right? So what that means is, okay, if you go back to the top here, here's a 10%, 5%, uh, 0 0.025%, 0 1% area would be 2.32, 2.33, right? So if you go to degrees of freedom of infinity, then the T table becomes exactly Z table, right? In, in other words, T distribution is identical to Z, Z uh, distribution, and uh, we see this consistency, right? Consistency see, between the um, T table and Z table, okay? Well, we'll have opportunity to use Z table, T table later. All right. So, let's say we have a random sample of 25 uh, sample size, and mean, uh, sample mean comes out to be 50, and standard deviation was calculated. You know, you can exactly calculate standard deviation from a sample, right? And uh, if you want to find 95% confidence in about, about the population mean, then you can simply use this formula, right? 50 plus minus 2.0639, which we find from the T table. Uh, why don't we try, okay? So because 95% alpha is 0.05, right? And alpha divided by 2 is 0 0.025, right? And degrees of freedom would be 7, I'm, I'm sorry, 24, right? Degrees of freedom would be 24, right? So go to T table, uh, locate the column for 0 0.025 here, right? 0 0.025 and come down to 24. The T score is 2.0639, right? 2.0639. So that's how this number is found. Okay. So you use that here, and S over divide a square divided by square root of 25. We find uh, this confidence interval. Okay. So tell me, what is it? Someone interpret that uh, result. What's the interpretation of this uh, confidence interval? I told you two ways to interpret the confidence interval, but usually we use first way. I'm sorry, try again. These two numbers. Very good, yeah. So make sure you are able to do that, right? You are 95% confident that actual population mean or true population mean exists between these two numbers, right? Even though we are, we have, there is no way we can be 100% confident that the, what the population mean is, at least we have now the, uh, located the, uh, the, air, the range, okay? The interval in which actual population mean exists, and, and we can say that with 95% confidence, okay? Okay, very good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here's a, uh, just a one more uh, the word of caution. Okay. So this interpretation or entire use of this formula requires assumption that the population is normally distributed. Okay. So you can check it, you know, by using normal probability plot or box plot. But again, if you can't check it, right, then you can rely on central limit theorem, right, and just you know, make sure you have sufficiently large sample, right? So here in this case, you couldn't apply the central limit theorem because sample size was only 25, right? And I guess we have no idea of the shape of the population, right? Then we have to be careful how to use this formula and making the interpretation. Okay? All right, so next topic is instead of sample mean, how about dealing with sample proportion, okay? So instead of,
instead of uh, calculating 100 times 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval for mu, instead now we are talking about population proportion. Okay. Uh, well, the same thing. We use the same formula, which is sample proportion, right? Plus minus p alpha divided by two. Now this time, what the standard error of estimate? Last class we talked about standard error of estimate for proportion was uh, square root uh, pi one minus pi over sample size. Okay, so it's, well, uh, we can use that, but since pi is unknown, right, we can simply use p, 1 minus p, oops, over n, okay, right? Uh, but here we have to satisfy two conditions, okay? n times p and n times 1 minus p, uh, oh, sorry. Z. Sorry, that was an important mistake. <laughs> it's easy to make that mistake, right? Uh, why do we use Z when the P is unknown, right? Well, because uh, because as long as you satisfy th these two conditions, n P times n P is greater than five, one minus uh, P times n is greater than five, then we can say this standard error follows normal distribution, okay? So according to that uh, fact, we use a Z distribution instead of P distribution. So that's something, one thing you have to remember when you're dealing with proportion instead of uh, mean, okay? Other, other things are exactly the same, right? So here's an example. The random sample of 100 people shows that 25 by left-handed. So we, we know the sample proportion. Sample proportion is 0.25, right? Now we want to know uh, population proportion, but of course there is no way you can find exactly uh, the population proportion, right? So instead of actual uh, calculation, we try to find the <coughs> confidence interval, yeah? Form a 95% confidence interval for the true population proportion. Well, you use the formula and find out that it's somewhere between 16.5% and 33.5%, right? So in the entire population, right, about 16.5%, well, the uh, true proportion of left-handers are between these two numbers, okay? Nothing difficult, right? Any questions so far? All right? I'm going a little fast because uh, if you go slow, it can be very boring. Okay. Can put uh, many of you to sleep. Okay. All right, here we have completely different topic. This is probably the last topic in this chapter. Okay. Um, determining the sample size. Okay. So in order to understand what we are talking about here, why don't we look at this question first? Okay. This is a, a, the, the problem from your textbook. Is a, whether you, you have 60 edition or 70 edition, this question is the same, right? So an advertising agency that serves a major radio station wants to estimate the mean amount of time that the station's audience spends listening to the radio daily, right? So we're try, trying to calculate the uh, population mean, okay? The, uh, uh, or the population mean is unknown, okay? Then the, from past studies, the standard deviation is estimated as 45 minutes. In other words, let's assume, let's assume sa uh, population standard deviation is 45, okay? Then if you want to calculate the confidence interval, 95, let's say 90% confidence interval, uh, with the, the being correct uh, within plus minus five minutes, okay? So what we're talking about here is we're trying to come up with the, the, uh, the interval, but we want this, this, what do you want? Sampling error to be limited. 
we don't want. So it's a slightly different concept. We're talking about, you know, you eventually we're going to come up with this uh, confidence in about using the formula plus minus something, right? But we want this size to be limited. So this is, I'm going a little bit ahead of myself, but uh, this is sampling error or typically it's called the error bound error bound or what's the uh, other name? I didn't even open my notes here. <laughs> sampling error, error bound, uh, sometimes we call it uh, ah, margin of error. margin of error. This is a very timely thing right now because, uh, you know, uh, elections, when is the election? Next week? Next week is the election, right? And uh, you hear this news all the time about the, uh, who's leading, who's lagging, right? And then in Korean they say, Hoyong uh, Ochabami. Hoyong Ochabami is what we call margin of error. Okay? So what we're trying to, well, you'll see what, exactly what, what I'm talking about. Right? So if you want to limit the size of this margin of error, right? what's the, uh, the required size of sample? Okay? Why does the sample size matter? I think I, you remember from previous chapter, right? the relationship between standard error and sample size. If the sample size goes up, what happens to standard error? <coughs> goes down, <coughs> of course, because standard error is either S over square root of N or this, right? So if you use larger sample, then you can reduce the standard error, right? And this is nothing but well, you typically it's Z or T alpha divided by 2 over standard error, times standard error. Okay? So if you want to limit the size of, if you have some maximum size for allowable margin of error, right? That means you have to have at least certain size of the sample. Make sure you understand this relationship, right? That's what we're talking about here, right? So if you have certain idea about the, the, the maximum allowable margin of error, or error bound, right? Then what is the required sample size, okay? Well, it's very simple. Look at this formula. Here's the typical uh, confidence interval formula, and we are talking about this term inside the red circle, right? That's what we call error bound or sampling error or margin of error, okay? So from that, why don't we just, okay, what we're trying to do is we have certain number E. Again, E stands for error or error bound, right? And we want this error bound to be a certain number, right? Then we can just rearrange this equation and solve for n, right? So from this equation, just solve for n, then we find this formula. That's the formula we're going to use to calculate the required size of n. Okay? So idea is pretty simple, as long as you understand what we're doing. Okay? <laughs> okay. Hejin. You okay? All right. So here's an example. If sigma is 45, what sample size is needed to estimate the mean within plus minus five within with the 90% confidence, right? Well, here, this is actually the solution for. 
this problem, problem A, right? So we have uh, error bound of plus minus five minutes, okay? So you don't want uh, the error to be more than five minutes if you calculate the, uh, the average time audience spends listening to the radio daily, right? And we'll, you want to be 90% confident, okay? So alpha level is 0.1, okay? And the error bound is 5, right? So in order to solve that problem, you use this. So first of all, you have to look for z. Okay. So in this problem, sigma is known to be 45. Alpha is 0.1. Okay. And the formula is n z alpha divided by 2 square sigma square divided by error or error square. Okay? So you have to look for z score which has alpha divided by 2 right? on its outside. Right? So how do you go? Go back to z table here. Okay? And we're looking for 0.5. Yeah? Alpha divided by 2 is 0.5. We're looking for z score which has 0 0.0, 0.05, okay? That's z alpha divided by 2, or z 0.05, okay? All right, so from here, uh, look at, where is 0 0.05 here? 0 0.05, okay, we have to go over one more here. 0 0.043, 0 0.044, 0 0.044, Oh, 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 oh. Point oh five. Okay, here we go, right? We have point oh four nine five and point oh five oh five. So that will be exactly between these two numbers, right? Point zero five zero five and point zero four nine five, right? And this is one point six four and this is one point six five, right? So that's how you come up with this is 1.645, right? All right? So that's 1.645 square, 45 square over 5 square, right? And comes out to be 219.19, right? Remember, this is the minimum sample size, okay? So that means you have to have 220 observations in your sample, okay? That's how you use this formula. Any question? Yeah. Right. I mean, it, I mean, in the context of this, problem, we're talking about number of people, right? How many people are you going to survey to find out how many minutes they listen to this radio every day, right? So, yeah. Uh, sample size is usually discrete because you're talking about number of observations in your sample. Okay? Good. Okay. If you want, you can try question number 8.42 at your leisure, right? It's a similar question. Yeah. If we have time today, we'll go back to that question, okay? All right. All right, here another question we, you can ask is, okay, we have this formula. But the professor always tells you that, that sigma is probably unknown, right, in real life, right? So what's the use of this formula? Well, what if, what if uh, sigma is unknown, right? Well, then you have to estimate or guesstimate, right? Uh, sigma, you have to calculate or estimate sigma, right, 
using the best known fact or you, to the best of your knowledge or the best of information you have, right? So if you read the chapter, one thing they suggest is if you know, if you know the range, the minimum and maximum value of the population, right? Then you know the, uh, the, the range, entire range is usually six sigma. Six sigma. You remember that? If you have a normal distribution, right? Three standard deviation area usually covers what? 100% or 99.7%, right? So if you know the range, then you can divide it by six to calculate or estimate sigma, okay? Well, even that is not very realistic. If you don't know the pop if you don't have actual population, right? Then how do you know the range, right? Well, then what you can do is you can select a small sample. It's called the pilot sample. <clears throat> and calculate the sample standard deviation. Okay? And use that to replace sigma here. So you, instead of sigma you use sample standard deviation. Okay. All right. Well, then the next, the natural topic, the following topic is well, what about proportion? Instead of dealing with the sample mean, what if you deal with the proportion? Well, we use the same thing. Okay. So again, the uh, we're talking about error bound. Instead of this, we have pro sample proportion plus minus z alpha divided by two. Remember, we use z all the time instead of t uh, here. T, okay. And uh, square root of p one minus p over n, right? And now we want this to be equal to error bound, right? So based on that, we can. Uh, calculate this formula, right? N is z square times pi, 1 minus pi e square, right? All right. Well, what if population proportion is unknown? Then what you can do is, again, you have to estimate uh, sample proportion, population proportion, right? So you can use the pilot sample, Small, take a small sample and find out what proportion satisfies this condition, right? Or you can use point of, I mean, point 0.5, conservatively, use point 0.5 as an estimate of pi. What, what does that mean, right? Why or how can you do that? When the proportion, population proportion is unknown, right? Well, what that means, is is this. You know, we're talking about pi and one minus pi. People who say yes or people who don't say yes, right? Or defective item, non-defective item, right? So we're talking about pi, always pi and one minus pi instead of, I mean, when you're dealing with proportion, right? And when you add them up, it's always one, right? So it's like you have a rectangle, okay? And if you know the uh, circumference, circumference, you know circumference, the length of the side, okay? If you add them up. If, if, if this is x, this is y, right? The circumferences will be 2 times x plus y, right? And if you know the circumference, then we can have many rectangles that have the same circumference, okay? Let's say this is 20, which means x plus y 
is 10. OK? Then out of all the rectangles that satisfy this condition, which one has the largest area? Any idea? Do you understand my question? Right? If you have many rectangles, let's say, let me give you some example. So it could be 2, 7. If you have a square, that's going to be 5, 5, I mean 2, 2, 8. Right? Or if you, you can have 3, 7. Right? All the rectangles that satisfy this condition, right? Which one has the largest area? 5, 5. You know that, right? So that's what we're talking about here, right? If we have this condition, pi plus 1 minus pi is always equal to 1, right? Then if pi is 0 0.5, or let's say 0 0.49, then 1 minus pi would be 0 0.51, right? <laughs> this will be the largest. We'll find the largest standard error. Okay? So you're trying to be conservative. You are allowing standard error to be largest, okay? satisfying certain condition. Okay? That's why we use 0.5. Okay? So if you can select a small sample and or pilot sample and look at, I mean, calculate the sample proportion. But even that is not possible. If if for some reason there is no way you can sample, take a sample, right? Then you can just use 0.5 for sam uh, sample proportion, right? right? That's an extreme case, I guess. All right, so let's say we have, have a question. Uh, how large a sample is necessary to estimate the true proportion of defective, defective items in a large population within plus minus 3% error bound and with 95% confidence. And let's say pilot sample years sample proportion of 0.12. Then you can use this formula. So again, here the uh, alpha level is 0 0.05. So alpha divided by 2 is 0 0.025, right? So z-score with 0 0.025, 0 0.025 outside, z 0 0.025 happens to be 1.96, right? Okay, 1.96, right? From the z-table. So you can use the formula and it comes out to be 450.74, which means the minimum necessary sample size is 451. Okay? Bored? Easy? Too easy? All right. Here we go. Here's an, something that can spark your interest here. I got this from uh, yesterday's uh, MBN news. Actually, I went to Neighbor News, okay? and they had this MBN news uh, result. Okay? So as of yesterday, the, the support rate for Mr. Park was 50.6%. Per Mr. Chung is 31.2%. Okay? So what is the required sample size if you want to be 95% confident with 4% margin of error about this result. Why don't you calculate it now using this formula? Okay. If you want to be 95% confident about, confident about this result, and you don't want to allow more than 4% plus minus okay, for these numbers, what's the required sample size? Would you use uh, population mean formula or population proportion formula? Proportion, right? This is a, we're talking about proportion of people who support each candidate, right?
I'll give you one minute. All right, his answer is 600.164. So what's the answer? What's the minimum sample size? 601, right? Good. If you read the fine prints here, okay, here, it's hard to see. Chosadazan. Songin Namnya Yukbang Myung. Right? So you know where they came up with that number, right? 600 people. Why they survey 600 people? To be exact, they should have used 601 people, right? In order to, for their comp, the, the result to be valid. Did anybody try plus minus three? Here, uh, in case you didn't see this, that was exactly, it said uh, down here, 95% confidence interval plus minus 4.0 percentage point, right? So that's exactly what, uh, what we did here. But uh, perhaps they did 601 people, right? Instead of 600. What happens uh, if you use plus minus three? Will, will it require a larger sample size or a smaller sample size? Larger, right? Because you're tr reducing the error mar margin of error, right? That requires a larger sample. Alone. Okay, as long as you have that understanding. Any questions so far? Okay, so the rest is what we know already, right? As we've talked about it a couple of times already, this uh, standard error, using s over square root of n as standard error, that has one very fundamental assumption. The assumption is you're selecting this sample with replacement, right? So before you put another person into your sample, you put that person back to the population so that that person has second chance, another chance to be selected, right? That's the idea of replacement, right? Which is not usually done, right? Which is impossible to, to be done in, in many cases, right? If you are selecting, uh, let's say, yeah, yeah, okay, well, Defective, you are testing for defective ratio, right? You pr uh, produce, say, 1,000 spark plugs uh, during the last hour, right? And you want to select a small sample of 10 spark plugs, right? So what that means is you select one and you completely measure everything, right? Go through the entire measurements and put it back to the population and so that before you select the next one, right? All right. But uh, many times it's not done in reality, right? And then we need to make an adjustment, right? Especially if you're selecting more than 5% of the population into your sample, right? So the only the thing you need to do is you just multiply this uh, uh, finite population correction factor, right? And we did that last time, right? So here's an example. If you have population of 1,000 and you're selecting 10% sample, right, then you have to make some adjustment, population correction factor, right, and here's uh, the final result, right, the confidence interval, okay. Um, let me see. We're going to omit some sections in this chapter, 